Welcome everyone to today's webinar, how to improve resource model accuracy with inaccurate data. My name is David Barry. I'm a senior consultant in geostatistics in the Perth office of Geovariances. Um, webinar should last about half an hour today. Uh, you have a section in the uh, webinar interface uh, to ask questions and I'll get to those at the end of the presentation and a uh, video link will be or a link to the video will be sent to you usually um, within 24 hours after the webinar is finished. Uh, you'll all be muted for the presentation so all of your questions will have to be um, via the text interface. So a couple of concepts to get us going on this uh, on this topic today, accuracy versus precision. So um, if we're talking about um, precision, that means here we have a, a sort of a classic diagram of, of uh, shots on a, uh, on a target. If there's a very tight spread, uh, that means we have high precision. And if they're all uh, more or less on average over the bullseye, that means we have high accuracy. So um, unbiased, this first uh, first graphic is, it, it represents high accuracy, high precision. So that's unbiased. The second graphic, we have uh, some bias. Uh, we still have high precision because there's not much spread in these results, but there's a systematic uh, error in their location. Uh, we could have the opposite case where there's no overall bias, but the precision is low. Um, and we could be in the worst case where we have a bias and uh, we have poor accuracy as well. Um, in a mining context, there's two sorts of data types that we'll be considering today. We'll think of uh, high quality, unbiased data we'll, uh, can have in our heads um, diamond drill holes. So these are uh, very well measured. Um, but in the production phase of a mining operation, uh, samples could be uh, taken from blast holes. And these are like they, they, they contain some information for us, but they're not as high quality as the diamond drill holes. So we'll assume that there's uh, less accuracy in, um, in such data, maybe some, uh, maybe a bias in them. And there, there, there could be other types of bias sampling as well, face samples, what have you. Uh, the point is, in our imagined data sets where we would apply the techniques of today's webinar, we will have some data that we can treat as accurate and precise and others that may be biased and would in general be uh, imprecise. And so the question is, what should we do with these imprecise and biased samples? And there's a couple of um, intuitively appealing possibilities. One is to say, well, they're imprecise and biased, so we'd be better off getting rid of them. Um, otherwise, you know, we'll just import that bias into our results, into our block models. And the other appealing intuitive suggestion is to use them somehow say, okay, they might be biased, they might be imprecise, uh, but it's still better to have uh, more data than less data. So, okay, if we do use them, uh, will we still have good quality estimates? Um, can it help improve uh, medium-term mine planning? And so the solution uh, proposed in today's webinar, we'll be uh, doing some multivariate geostatistics, treating the two variables or the two data sets as giving us different variables that are nevertheless correlated, and we can do some uh, geostatistics with them. Um, to, to sort of spoil the answer, we'll be doing some co creaking. Now, multivariate geostats, um, not always. Uh, uh, a huge improvement in the, uh, in the quality of our estimates. It will depend on the type of data that we have. And this graphic here is representing um, a spectrum of cases in the left-handed edge of the spectrum. We have some isotopic data. So we have two uh, 
types of measurements, two variables. Um, here with the circles are representing the main variable of interest. So that would be our accurate measurements. And the triangles are representing some auxiliary variable, or in our case, um, sort of less precise, possibly biased uh, measurements. Now, if we have both of these types of measurements at every sample location, the auxiliary variable isn't giving us much extra information. It's not much use because everywhere where we have any information, we have the exact uh, precise measurement. So this one may be not so useful um, if we're trying to, uh, you know, multivariate geostatistics would be uh, not so useful for estimation purposes. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, in a purely heterotopic case, uh, it means we don't have any uh, sample locations where we have both types of measurement. Um, uh, that situation is more difficult to work with. It's not impossible to work with. Um, you can calculate cross covariances, but the difficulty is we don't have, uh, with, without having any locations with both variables defined, we can't calculate the, uh, the point correlation uh, between the two. We have to maybe do some migration uh, you know, from, from one data set to the other over short distances and do some comparisons there. Um, the problems are not insurmountable, uh, but they do present some extra difficulties. Uh, the middle case of this partially heterotopic data uh, is the ideal case for multivariate geostats. We have some uh, locations where uh, both variables are defined, and that allows us to uh, use those locations to figure out what the correlation is, what the spatial behavior is, calculate cross variograms and so forth. Um, but we have extra locations where like maybe one, maybe the other variable are defined. And uh, those extra locations can be used to help improve the, uh, the quality of the, um, of the estimate of the other variable. So that's the, uh, the situation we will hope to be in. Now, there are various uh, techniques available to us if we want to do multivariate geostats in Isardis Neo. Um, the one I'll be focusing on today is the first one, co-kriging or rescaled co-kriging. Um, two, like our two different measurement types will be considered uh, two different variables uh, that are somehow correlated. Um, both somehow representative, although one of them may be biased and, and imprecise. Uh, we will be making stationarity assumptions here. Um, in particular for rescaled co-kriging, um, this one as implemented in the software, we'll be, we'll be assuming that if there is a bias between our two uh, data types, that it's constant across the domain. Um, now that is a, an extra stationarity assumption, might not always be correct. Um, so you'd have to, uh, to check carefully before blindly going ahead with uh, any sort of this analysis. Um, other possibilities, Kriging with external drift is uh, more commonly used in petroleum uh, where they have a lot of seismic data, which is, uh, uh, gives extremely dense sampling of some variable or variables that are correlated with the main uh, variables of interest. And uh, that seismic can be used as a, a non-stationary trend uh, that, that is input into the, uh, into the estimation. Another possibility, uh, creating with variance of measurement error. Um, if our uh, variables are not biased, um, but what some of our measurements are imprecise uh, and we're able to quantify uh, how imprecise and as, as a variance of the measurement error, uh, then that can be added um, or to augment the Kriegin calculation and basically downweight the imprecise data in the Kriegin neighborhood. Um, there are 
possibilities here, some of which I disagree with, some of which I think are fine. Um, so we'll be looking at the co-creaking or rescaled co-creaking. Now co-creaking, uh, if you've done a little bit of multivariate geostats, you'll probably be familiar with it. This is the main uh, idea of multivariate estimation. Um, the sum of the weights of the main variable are equal to one, the sum of the weights of the secondary variable are equal to zero. And because we're not, uh, because we're making the sum of the weights of the secondary variable equal to zero, now that means if there's any bias on the secondary variable, it gets cancelled out. The problem with, or potential problem with just ordinary co creaking is that uh, because the sum of the weights of the secondary variable uh, is equal to zero, if we have some correlation there, if the secondary variable is giving us some information, uh, we'll have some positive weight from it, we must also have some negative weights. And uh, negative weights in abstract theory land is uh, perfectly fine. And just, that's just what comes out of the uh, Kriging equations. Uh, but in practice, the real world is not really following all of the uh, assumptions of a perfectly stationary random function and so forth. And negative weights, when they get attached to a high outlier value, you get a negative number multiplied by a big positive number, uh, they can give you some negative estimates and that's uh, undesirable. Uh, so that's a potential issue with ordinary co-creaking and it's uh, trying to fix that is the motivation behind rescaled co-creaging where we uh, basically take the uh, difference between our two variables, so the overall mean values, and we uh, basically add an offset to the, uh, to the secondary variable so that it has the same mean as our main variable. Now, we are going to, uh, that is a stationarity assumption that we're, that we're able to do this, that we have this ability to offset the, um, the secondary variable by a constant amount. Um, it is an extra assumption, uh, but it then does allow us to have a sum of weights equal to one across both variables combined. So we don't necessarily have a lot of negative weights. And uh, that's the, the hope of rescaled co-creaking is that um, by making this extra stationarity assumption, uh, we can uh, reduce uh, the negative impacts of negative weights. Um, it is a bit of a hybrid stationarity assumption because in the rescaled co-creaking itself, we will, we will be doing ordinary creaking. The sum of the weights will be equal to one, uh, but there is this uh, assumption about um, constant mean differences, which would be have to, you, you would want to investigate that before uh, applying it in a real world case. Now, in terms of real world cases, my Brazilian colleagues in geovariances have applied the rescaled co-creaking technique. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the big Latin American mining company um, hasn't given us uh, permission to, to talk about it in the webinar. So instead, I'll be using good old Walker Lake, you know, venerable uh, uh, artificial data set, which has been in use for several decades. We have an exhaustive data set giving us in the uh, world of this um, example, the ground truth values everywhere, both at a fine scale and then that'll be reblocked to this uh, five by five grid, um, which can be used as a, uh, for comparison with the various estimates that we've made on it. And the data set that will be created will have a um, hard data, so considered precise and accurate, uh, measured on a 20 meter by 20 meter sampling grid and soft data, so imprecise, inaccurate on a five meter by five meter grid. Now the soft data has been basically cooked by my uh, Brazilian colleagues. They've taken the real numbers and they've added some, uh, some random noise to it and then hit it with a 25% bias. Uh, so giving us something that's uh, is biased high and, and isn't perfectly correlated with the, uh, with the main uh, variable of interest. But we do have lots more information 
of this soft, imprecise data. And the hope is that they can improve our estimates. Input data statistics, histogram of the hard data, we have 195 samples, mean of 2.7, maximum about 10. Uh, we have over 3,000 soft samples, mean of 3.4, so these are biased high, maximum going all the way up to almost 19. So uh, these are clearly biased and um, we would like to nevertheless use these results uh, in the estimate. We can check that there is indeed some correlation between these two measurements. So this is the scatter plot. The dashed blue line here is representing the regression line, got a correlation of 0.63. And the next step uh, in the Workflow is to model the cross variograms between these two variables. So using the sample locations on which both variables are defined, uh, we calculate the variograms of each variable individually and the cross variogram. So sort of the spatial correlation between them. If you don't have any samples on which both variables are defined, so you don't have any locations at which you have uh, both types of measurements, uh, you can't calculate a cross variogram. You can calculate a cross covariance, uh, but there will be uh, an extra tricky step in modeling the uh, the point covariance for the uh, for the cross covariance. In this example, it's in the more gentle case where we do have 195 samples on which we can calculate and model these cross variograms. So now three different possible estimation methods will be presented in the slides. Um, ordinary co-creaking using only the hard data. So throwing away all of the biased imprecise data that would potentially mess it up. Uh, the second one will use the uh, all of the data pulled together. So uh, that's pretending that the biased data is unbiased and just going ahead with the estimation anyway. And it won't be too much of a spoiler to say that this doesn't work very well because it leads to biased estimates. And the third one is rescaled co-creaking. Um, and uh, the, this, I'll talk a little bit uh, once I show the software. Uh, there's a couple of extra tweaks that you can add to this method, which I've, um, which I've used for the following slide. So here we have, because this is the Walker Lake data set and we have the true values, uh, we can actually compare um, the estimated with the uh, true uh, values. And so we can see that ordinary creaking using only the hard data points um, gives us a correlation of 0.69. These dashed lines in these graphs uh, are the y equals x lines. So uh, a perfect estimate would be exactly on this dashed line. In the middle case, ordinary creaking using all of the data, biased and unbiased, uh, we can see we've got a very good correlation. So it's quite a precise estimate, uh, but we can see that most of the points in the scatter plot are above the y equals x line, uh, telling us that the uh, estimates tend to be biased high. With the rescaled co-creaking using uh, the hard data as our main variable and the soft data as the secondary variable, which is correlated, uh, we can see that we get a, a pretty good uh, correlation, 0.89. And now the points are on either side of the uh, of the y equals x line. And uh, so this is uh, much less biased than simply pooling all of the data together. In terms of histograms, uh, this is the ground truth model, mean of about 2.8. Uh, ordinary creaking using the hard data, 2.7. Using the biased data as well as the correct data, we uh, have a biased mean of um, 3.4, so it's no good. We've overestimated the grades. Rescaled co-creaking, um, mean of 2.7. So uh, the ordinary creaking using only the hard data and the rescaled co-creaking using the hard and soft data, more or less unbiased. 
And if we look at the maps of the results, the reference model, the ground truth is on the left, ordinary Krieging using only the sparse 20 meter by 20 meter sampling, um, quite a smooth estimate. With all of the data in together, biased and unbiased, okay, we expect that the, we will get um, overestimates. So there's more of these red colors representing the high values, uh, too many of them if we compare to the reference model. The rescaled co um not perfect because we are still estimating. Um, it's not uh, not an exact science, um, but this is clearly a, a closer match to the ground truth than the uh, than the other techniques presented. And we could go ahead and calculate some great tonnage curves, the uh, sort of maroon brownish uh, curve represents the uh, the ground truth. Um, and it's the pink curve representing rescaled co creaking that tends to be closest to it. So that's uh, uh, suggestive uh, that the rescaled co creaking is doing a, a pretty decent job. Which means it's time to go into the software and see how we would do this. So this is Artist Neo, the latest version. Um, I've got a Heterotopic data set here with the uh, the variables um, used, 20 by 20 being the hard data and 5 by 5 being the uh, the soft data. I've actually transformed them. Uh, I've, I've created another set of two variables uh, standardized. So if I just build a histogram of this, mean zero uh, variance one. Um, some authors, uh, when writing about rescaled co creaking suggest standardizing the variables first. Um, this is something that if you do ordinary co creaking doesn't make any difference. Um, you'll get the same results at the end after you uh, like unnormalize. Um, but in rescaled co creaking if, uh, if you multiply your secondary variable by some constant, uh, you do actually change the, uh, the resulting creaking weights. So this is something that you can uh, tweak and you can test to see how it changes the accuracy. And I did find that I got better results uh, standardizing uh, than just doing rescaled co creaking without standardizing uh, in this data set. And I suspect it's because when the secondary variable was created, and this is an artificially created data set, um, there was a multiplicative bias inserted into the, into the soft data measurements. That's not a constant bias that is the assumption behind rescaled co creaking So standardizing the variances first sort of undoes uh, most of the multiplicative bias and then the rest of the workflow seem to be a little bit smoother for me. So there, there are things, are ideas there that you could uh, try to use. Statistics EDA. Uh, here I've got the unstandardized uh, variables loaded into the variogram. So heterotopic data, I could select two variables and drag them into variogram. Use what I've got previously set. And we have our main variable top left, secondary variable variogram bottom right, and the interaction between them, the cross variogram uh, bottom left. and Okay, I, I've cheated. I, I, I was doing this earlier, so it's all, all done for me. But if you wanted to change the fits, you can interactively change them when you're happy with it. Um, I should also mention, uh, if you're doing this, to do rescaled co creaking we have to select uh, strict stationarity uh, so that we can define means, which will be used in the, in the rescaled co creaking uh, So not doing ordinary creaking. Uh, or at least not the, the usual variety of ordinary Krieging. Save, and I would uh, save this variogram model to a geostatistical set, which would contain, uh, in this case, just the cross variogram model and some auxiliary information for it. Interpolation Krieging, basically all types of Krieging in his RCO done in the Krieging window. We load which geoset uh, we want to use. Um, if we're doing a single variable, we just have the, the 
previously calculated and modeled variogram for the for the hard data. So I'm doing the um, standardized version. Um, I load the cross variogram model saved for that. Output is my grid, in this case a five by five grid, which matches the spacing of the uh, of the soft data. Block Krieging, we'll discretize five by five, define some search neighborhood and number of samples. And we have um, output variables. And it looks like I forgot to do something. I forgot to click the rescaled co-krieging option, which is the, the whole point of the webinar. So now my output variables will be labeled RCK for rescaled co-krieging. If I were to run this, I would get um, some results. I would then have to go to the calculator and uh, and unnormalize them if I were working with the, the normalized results. Um, can calculate mean and standard deviation on my input data, subtract off the mean divided by the standard deviation. So that's all possible. Um, just a little bit of extra pre-processing and post-processing if you want to normalize the data first. Um, if you don't see the need to do the standardization, you can skip those steps. You just do the cross variogram, you do the rescaled co creaking, um, and then you're ready to go. So here I've got a map of uh, my results. I can compare it. So that's the using all of the, the hard and soft data together, just the hard data. Um, co creaking uh, without doing the rescaled co creaking uh, If I just show that, actually, I'll co creaking versus rescaled co creaking uh, The main difference here with the co creaking at least with this neighborhood, uh, is giving me some uh, quite strongly negative estimated values that I avoid, well, not completely avoid, but I reduce by going via the rescaled co creaking So not as many negative weights issues, not as many um, negative estimate problems with the rescaled Coke rigging. And uh, that is the uh, the very brief tour of how to implement rescaled Coke rigging inside Azardis Neo. So the key point is that we have our two measurement types in two different variables. Calculate and model a cross variogram or cross covariance model. Uh, we set the stationarity option to rescale the co-creaking. We do have to define the uh, the mean values for that, which is a stationarity assumption. And then we go to creaking to uh, to do the um, to do the estimation itself, ticking the option rescaled co-creaking. So that's the end of the demo. Uh, you can think of some questions and you can type them into the questions section uh, of the GoToWebinar interface. And in the meantime, I'll tell you that uh, geovariances can help, help you implement uh, these techniques and others in geostatistics. Uh, geovariances, uh, global provider of geostatistics-based solutions, uh, market leader and reference uh, for several decades. Um, pioneer in advanced geostatistics, uh, thanks to a technical partnership with the Center of Geostatistics at uh, what they used to call the School of Mines in Paris, um, now Mean Pahi, founded in 1986. Um, so several decades of experience. We have uh, 40 plus technical experts, consultants, and software developers across several offices. There's a couple of us in Perth, the head offices in Fontainebleau in France, quite a few people in the Americas as well. Uh, we're now part of the Vela Industries Group as of uh, last year. Um, the GeoVariances brand will be continuing as a uh, as a separate uh, brand, so uh, GeoVariances and Azardis Neo will continue, but we will be. Uh, in the same family as Data Mine, Aquire, Snowden, Optero, MindMax, and others. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about geostatistics, we do have some upcoming training sessions, um, mineral resource estimation, uh, both aimed at the European time time zone and at the Australian time zone. 
so mineral resource estimation for linear geostatistics, recoverable resource estimation for some nonlinear. Um, on demand, we have others uh, available, and we're also available for consulting uh, services. Uh, you may also be interested in the CFSG, which is a, uh, a French abbreviation. Uh, the meaning is a 10-week uh, online training program in uh, geostatistics uh, spread out over the year. Uh, I'll be starting uh, pretty soon for Asia Pacific in March for Europe and Africa and the Middle East. Um, a goal or aimed at uh, geologists and engineers wanting to achieve a high level of geostatistics. Uh, we've, we'll have um, lecturers from the uh, from the School of Mines and the Center for Geostats. So, uh, um, yeah, a good quality, uh, rigorous uh, overview and, and getting into the detail of the theory and practice of geostatistics. Which takes us to the questions, and now I will. Um, look and see what we have. Alex asks, um, if the soft data were the smaller data set and there were no coincident data points, what would be your thoughts? Um, so the, the not having any coincident data points there is, is going to be the, the main difficulty. Um, if you have some data points that are close, uh, then you could do something with it. You can migrate the values over and do some comparisons, compare it with the, the nugget of the variogram of the of the hard data, um, whether it's worth it um, for a small amount of extra information, uh, you know, you would have to you know, treat it on a case by case basis, right? It's uh, you can imagine one extreme where you've got like one soft data point. Well, that's not very useful, but if you've got a decent amount of soft data and it helps uh, inform the uh, the estimates uh, sort of in between your um, main drilling, then uh, you know, potentially it's useful. Um, Angelina asks, can you please confirm that for rescaled Kriging, uh, we need both variables sampled in the same locations? It's not a requirement. It makes it a lot easier um, because if you don't have variables, at least, at least some of the uh, variables defined at the same locations, then you can't calculate a cross variogram. You are able to calculate a cross covariance model. Um, so it, it's not an insurmountable problem, uh, but that is more difficult uh, because you don't have the point covariance. You can get almost all of the cross covariance curve, but not the point at distance zero, um, and, or you can't directly get it. You have to sort of infer it from, uh, from the closest pairs of samples that you have. Um, so it becomes easier if you have uh, have the variable sampled at least sometimes in the same locations. Uh, Henri Sanginetti asks, in grade control we manipulate data on different size support. Is there possibility to consider volumes in the method? And uh, wow, that's... Uh, that's one I was not expecting, and I do not have a ready answer to it. Um, there is a, a technique called mixed support creating, which I'm not overly familiar with. Um, it may be that if you if your secondary data is all consistently on a different support, uh, but it's the same support for all of the, the secondary data, um, then maybe you can just apply the method of co-creaking, rescaled co-creaking without, um, without any modifications. If your secondary data is on differing support sizes, then you probably have to go uh, and, and those changes of support size are, are significant somehow. They systematically change the variances of the data on, on the different support sizes. Um, then you probably have to go to mixed support creaking. Um, 
and I will have to confess, I don't know a lot about that te technique. I've, um, I've heard a couple of presentations on it. Um, some of it seems reasonable and some of it seems uh, uh, like I don't just don't understand what's going on with, uh, with how they're computing variograms from all these different support sizes. I think it's generally okay if you, um, if you can model the variogram on the smallest sort of point support, you can sort of regularize it to larger supports. Um, although in this case, um, if, if your secondary data is sort of less precise as well, that would be an extra wrinkle to be added to, to the procedure. Um, so uh, I, I guess my conclusion is maybe um, that it would uh, would need, at least on my part, uh, a bit of thought. It's possible that somewhere, someone else out there has uh, solved this problem already um, and I just don't know about it. Um, but I think that's, that's the best I can do for now, is that there, there are techniques that may uh, help in these situations. Um, but I don't know if the full constellation of them can combine together to solve all of the problems. And we have no more questions. So that'll be the end of the webinar. Um, after this is over, you will be uh, sent an evaluation form. Uh, please fill that out. It's always useful for us to, uh, to get feedback on these uh, on these presentations and what you would like to see in the future. So thanks if you can do that, and uh, thanks for all uh, all of you attending. And if you want to watch the recording, you'll get a video uh, a link to a video sent to you uh, probably in the next 24 hours. Thanks all. Goodbye.